Hey, this is Amy Ray. I just played a show here at Ram's Head Live, opening for Brandy Carlisle with my band. And she was nice enough to sit down with us tonight, so uh, we're going to go ahead and have a little conversation and just hang out, alright? So enjoy. So, um, this is the first show off of the Indigo Girls uh, tour right now, right? Yeah, I mean, I did, um, I've been touring off and on with mm -hmm. my band in okay. between Indigo Girl tours. Oh, okay. Yeah, well, what's so that like, going back and forth? Um... I like it actually. I really yeah. like it. I jump off the tour bus and go pick my van up and my trailer and hook it up and yeah. Is there like a transition band. that happens, like for you um, mentally or as an artist, or is it just kind of? There you probably is, but I don't even think about it anymore. It's yeah. all the same. It all works together for me now, and um, you know, yeah. And and a lot of the places like like that I'm playing with Brandy, mm -hmm. I've played with Indigo Girls. I feel comfortable, you know. And then a lot of the clubs we play when we headline are places I played years ago with Emily. So it's. It just feels like home to me. Nice. Yeah. Nice and comfy. Yeah. Um, so uh, do you feel like, as far as um, you doing your solo stuff, I know you have three solo albums, do you feel mm -hmm. like there's carryover from Indigo Girls fans, or do you feel like you like you and your band are something completely separate? <laughs> I mean, we want, you know, it would be nice to feel yeah. like we, we could get a following mm -hmm. at some point, but um, I, don't, I don't know how many people, mm -hmm. Indigo Girl fans, I, I think that that's where my original fan base came mm -hmm. from, but I think it's shifted a lot, because I okay. think there's... There's probably a, a majority of Indigo Girl fans that, you know, we're, what we're doing is pretty loud. So maybe yeah. that's not their bag or whatever, and that's, mm -hmm. that's cool. And so we sort of had to dip into some other areas. And, and you know, originally when I started my solo stuff, I was playing with um, a band called that was called The Butchies. Mm -hmm. And two of them still play with me, but they had a really big following. So we, we really, it, it drew a lot from that kind as well. Kind of brought them both together. Yeah, and they were more of a else. kind of a punk rock following so it cool. kind of helped me bring that in and then mm -hmm. the indigo girl fans that like what i'm doing came and it kind of combined cool awesome so you have your own record label i do okay cool um what's going on with that i mean like how do you kind of bring new artists in like what do you look for well I haven't do you have a big role in that yeah i mean it, okay. well i'm the only person that works there <laughs> right now so <laughs> i haven't brought a new artist in for a couple of years because i've just been focusing yeah. on my own stuff and i'm kind of mm -hmm. guinea pigging myself because i I think that the industry has mm -hmm. changed so massively that a lot of my friends that I would have normally put their records out, but they came to me and I said, you, you're you better off doing it yourself right now. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, not because I don't think I can work, I think I can work it, but I think they can work it as, just as well. Yeah. I think the access we have to the internet and, and different ways of promoting. Oh, promoting. social media? Absolutely. Yeah, you know, the guerrilla style mm -hmm. of promotion, is yeah. it works. Yeah. And it's probably the only thing working right now. And it's free. And it's free. And it's something and that it's people true. are really enjoying tapping into. Yeah, and it... And it you know, it motivates the artist mm -hmm. and it actualizes what they're doing. And so I, I will yeah. put some, I'll put some projects out, but I'm, yeah. I got to figure out what the best way to do that is. And I'm doing that with my mm -hmm. own record. I'm experimenting. Okay, cool. yeah. so are you, with social media, are you a big tweeter? Have you gotten into that? I yet? don't, I, I'm, I'm supposed to be tweeting and I haven't started <laughs> tweeting. That basically is what's happened. Supposed but to I be do, tweeting. yeah, I mean like I have it set up and I just can't mm -hmm. get my grip together to do it. But I do, um, when I'm touring, a lot of times I'll do like a diary and I do a lot of filming and oh, documentation. Cool. And, oh, awesome. Yeah. So you're into film. Yeah, I, I'm yeah. into film. I'm into Editing film. Or, or picking up footage? I just capturing. do like iMovie. I'm not, you know. Oh, okay. I'm not like. Do you have a Mac? I have a Mac. Yeah. I do iMovie. I film with my little digital cool. HD camera that I love and um, and then I hand it off to other people to film mm -hmm. and then I put together little web movies and stuff. Cool. That's my nice little hobby on the side. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> That's awesome. Um, so and I read something um, recently, or maybe it wasn't recently, I don't remember when it was from, but uh, as far as activism goes, like you were somehow involved with, um, you were traveling to Mexico a little bit with mm -hmm. the uh, Zapatista Rebellion. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. um, and it's interesting because I sat down with Thievery Corporation a couple weeks ago. Mm, and they're, love them. Oh, don't you? Yeah. Just eat it up? God. Yeah, yeah. yeah so, um, so I sat down with them, and they their um, album art for Radio Retaliation is a Zapatista fighter. Mm -hmm. And um, what was it that kind of drew you to mm. that cause? We started working, me and Emily started a group called Honor the Earth in the mm -hmm. early 90s. Yeah, and, and we funded Native American um, environmental activism and mm -hmm. cultural, sort of sustainable cultural sort of radical activism. Um, and the Zapatistas are indigenous mm. in Mexico, yeah. and some of the projects we funded had to do with them. So I went down there um, to interview some women mm. that were in the, um, you know, part of part of the military force, I guess I should say. Mm -hmm. And I interviewed them, but they were also, I also interviewed some women that were artists, because we were funding um, a, a, like an art project, because they whenever they had to go to town to pick up textiles to do their weavings mm -hmm. and stuff, they were being threatened by the military and sometimes being raped. 
and um, harassed. And so what they wanted was to stockpile a bunch of stuff so they wouldn't mm -hmm. have to make as many trips. And they needed to build a shelter and buy the stuff. And so we funded that. We funded some water trucks. Oh, wow. I've been down there a few times. Last time I went, it was incredible because it was like um, I had been to this one village in the middle of the rainforest, and there was there was really nothing there yet. And then and then like eight years later, there was like a school, a medical building, a meeting mm -hmm. place. You know, like they yeah. it, quite incredible. And then we left, and and there was like kind of a lockdown, and yeah. people couldn't really go down there. So it sounds like your involvement down there is very ground level. Like, what is that like emotionally? Do you mean kind of get down there and you just have to readjust? Yeah, I mean it's. I, I feel very humbled mm -hmm. by them. I feel humbled by all the native activists we work with, and, yeah. and the Zapatistas. You know, are very. It's a very concrete humbling because you're down there, and there's mm -hmm. there's a lot of military around, and um, and there's you, yeah, you're at the mercy mm -hmm. of kind of what's around you, so you're sort of in their care mm -hmm. and, and under their protection, and they're and um, and I value what they do, and I value what it's taught me in activism yeah. here. Yeah, and it helps with perspective. Yeah, I mean, and, and I mean, please, you know, it's like I'm a privileged <laughs> yeah, white, right? you know, upper class mm -hmm. at this point, well, middle class girl, and and it and you know, my only oppression that I know is being queer, and it's nothing yeah. compared to being a person of color, or being mm -hmm. indigenous, living in the situations that a lot of these people yeah. live in. So, yeah. um, and one thing that kind of always interests me is people who have, you know, like uh, musicians who have a platform to speak about the things that they care about. Mm -hmm. um, I always want to know. What, um, especially with musicians, because it's sometimes ambiguous as far as their actual intention for their audience. And I always mm. wonder about: Are you like? Is there any kind of activism that you are in, you, that you would like to see kind of instill in your fans, or is there a message there? Yeah, but it's not. I don't. We I mean, don't, not outright, but yeah. I mean, like we don't. We don't expect all of our fans to support the Zapati. I mean, mm. or support indigenous. You know, any of the issues, yeah. queer issues, gun control, whatever mm. we do. Because we know our fans are made up of a lot of different political persuasions, mm -hmm. but we expect what we what we want is our fans to engage in their community, mm -hmm. and you can be yeah. any, in any political community. party and engage in the community. Yeah. And mm -hmm. so, it it be as simple as you know working at the food bank, or you can be really radical um, yeah. left and do something, or you can be really radical right and do something. Mm -hmm. We just want people to take advantage, feel of what they are, yeah. and engage. Absolutely, and that's kind of I mean, especially with a lot of complacency that you see in the states. I think. Um, yeah. Wanting people to just, even if it's something I don't even agree with, I would still, I mean, for me or for anybody else, I mean, you want them to engage in the privileges that they have. Mm -hmm. And I think sometimes that's an uphill battle. And that's something that mm -hmm. I, mean, I feel like, as far as a musician and setting examples, that goes a long way. Yeah, I mean, we would. Can. Yeah, we would be doing it anyway. That, I mean, me and Emily mm -hmm. kind of grew up that way. So we sort of were like, this mm -hmm. is kind of what we know. Yeah. And we just feel like it's a way to, to do it. Cool. You know? um, so, on another note, do you have any. Um, Guilty pleasures or anything? Just well, obviously chocolate because <laughs> Brandy brought us. No, like, I saw her bring that in. I was like, "What is that?" It's this is obviously like, I mean, I'm gonna probably eat this tonight on the way to the hotel, and I won't be able to sleep. But um, guilty pleasures. Um, I love um, murder like, she wrote. Oh really? <laughs> yeah. And that's not really a guilty pleasure, but I love Matt Love. Oh no, yeah. I love murder she wrote. And I love um, Diagnosis Murder. I like the old um, 1980s mm -hmm. um, mystery. Was it Candace Bergman? No? Angela Lansbury. Oh, okay. okay. Who I love. Really? Yeah. Oh, nice. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Do you get into any of like the whole reality TV craze? Um, I have been known to watch Super Nanny a little bit. Oh, really? Yeah. Um, <laughs> Are the accents real? I have no idea. <laughs> I, I mean, I. It, but usually, I'm I'm watching TV when I work out, and that's like late at night. So it's usually oh, like nice. repeats of 1980s shows. Yeah. And, yeah. Nice. <laughs> yeah. Cool. All right. Well, thanks for sitting down with us. Thank you. Um. Uh, yeah. Thanks. Enjoy. All right.